a new study finds that fetuses actually have functional immune systems long before birth, helping them combat diseases and infections like Zika even when in the womb. The discovery could pave the way for new care methods for women who contract infections during their pregnancies. Scientists from the Duke NUS Medical School used mice to study fetal immune systems and their response to different strains of Zika virus. Now, they found that some immune cells took on a protective role and reduced damage to the developing brains of the fetuses. However, other immune cells triggered harmful inflammation, killing brain cells instead of eliminating the virus. An experimental anti-inflammatory drug was used to prevent damage to the brain. Now, here to tell us more about this study, we have lead author, Associate Professor Ashley St. John. Professor, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. So, your research used mice to study fetal immunity. How do the findings relate to human babies? That's a good question. So first, we tried to time exactly when we were studying this in mice so that it matched with the developmental time points you would find in humans. Mm. So we particularly studied it during this window uh, about the end of the first trimester and a beginning of second trimester equivalent okay. and tried to correlate those findings with what we think is happening in humans. The second way we did this was we actually used some human cells and we grew them into little mini brains and we were able to study Zika in those mini brains also combined with immune cells and neurons. So it was a, a complex system that we hope allows us to bridge that gap a little bit between the preclinical models and uh, what's happening in humans. The, these are very fascinating findings, but we are curious, why did your team choose to use different strains of Zika virus instead of other common infections? That's a, another good question. So one reason we started with this was because we weren't sure whether the strains of Zika that were circulating in Singapore at the time mm -hmm. uh, could actually cause these congenital defects. So we started asking this question, would they induce a similar response that we see with strains from other places? So we started using many different strains. Uh, we found that they do, in fact, induce congenital defects. So that's something that is important knowledge, we think, you know, reminds us to be vigilant about mm -hmm. Zika going forward. Um, but you know, the other reason uh, was that, you know, in the Emerging Infectious Diseases Program at Duke and U.S., we want to study those uh, infections that we may not expect yet to be a problem that could be. And I think we learned uh, from COVID that it's important to keep our research going on things that even here in Singapore, for example, happen very sporadically, uh, an outbreak of Zika, but mm -hmm. it's still an important uh, thing to study for future. On one hand, now these functional immune systems, they help to combat diseases, but other immune cells diseases uh, triggered harmful inflammation. Tell us more about that. Okay, so whenever we have an immune response, of course, sometimes it can be protective or sometimes it can be too much and we can have too much inflammation that can then become harmful. Mm. And so in the case of Zika, what we saw is that uh, initially in the brain, those immune cells that are present in the brain that live there are kind of like garbage collectors. They're able to pick up the Zika virus, uh, clear it, clear infected cells, and they do it uh, in a cool, calm manner so that it, uh, we, we get less infection. Um, in contrast to that, we had some other immune cells that we were able to observe that infiltrate into the brain. They are causing a lot of inflammation. Mm. And those cells we found were actually harmful. So when we tried to develop some therapeutic strategy, what we were trying to do is block the products they were making so that we didn't really interfere with the immune cells doing their job, but we uh, diminished the harmful inflammation to a certain extent. Is it common that there'll be two different immune responses observed with the Zika virus? So we saw that it's a little bit of a balance. Some strains induce a more harmful response and mm -hmm. some strains have a largely protective response. And in those cases, we don't see many congenital defects. So the immune okay. system is capable of protecting, mm. um, but just sometimes a little overzealous. Okay. And what would the results mean then for other kinds of infections uh, that pregnant women contract? That's a, another really good question. Mm. Uh, so first of all, we think that when you're looking at an immune response, those pathways often are triggered in similar ways between viruses. And that's why sometimes drugs that uh, modulate the immune response are a good strategy for trying to improve the symptoms of mm. viral infections uh, because you're not dealing with all of the different ways that viruses can interact with unique cells and unique viral proteins and things like that. You're actually going back to something that the immune system has been trained to do over um, you know, many 
many uh, millennia of evolution mm. respond to viruses. So th for that reason, we think that it actually could be fairly translatable to other viruses. Okay, and can the results of the experimental drug be replicated uh, with other infections as well? So we have, not, we have not done that yet, and that's okay. something that will be in the pipeline, mm -hmm. I believe, yes. Okay, and, and, you know, if we think about Zika virus infection, you know, we understand that pregnancy, uh, it, it, this infection can cause, during pregnancy can cause infants to be born with microcephaly, um, they can cause preterm birth and miscarriage as well. How can these findings help change the way we administer care to pregnant women can you share some examples, perhaps? That's a, another great question. Yeah. So when we are thinking about how we get things in to treat pregnant women, we have mm -hmm. a lot of obstacles. So uh, pregnant women are one of the groups who have the fewest medications that they can take. Mm -hmm. Even common drugs can't be taken during pregnancy. So from our standpoint, one thing that we are hoping to do is try to uh, do the safety testing that's needed at early stages to really understand how those drugs would uh, work during pregnancy and if they would be safe during pregnancy so okay. that we can then one day bring them into the clinic. What is next for your research then? Is there a timeline for the development? So from my perspective, uh, we have a few different drug candidates. We're trying very hard to push those forward to do the next steps of, of testing to try to understand how they affect the developing fetus and how they would affect a pregnant woman. Mm. Um, those are the next steps that we're looking forward to in the, in the short term, yeah. Okay, and we understand that the drug has not been tested in humans before. Uh, how far away uh, before we can actually see that taking place? Uh, I would say there's probably a pretty long delay between these early preclinical development stages mm. and uh, really bringing a drug into the clinic. But I think the important thing is once we've studied these immune pathways and we have a broad idea of what's happening in the fetus, it gives us many more options um, in terms of what we can go after as drug targets mm -hmm. uh, and what uh, our backup plan would be in the case that some of these drugs don't necessarily uh, you know, pass those early stages. So I think with this broad knowledge, we can really try harder to push more treatments that modulate the immune system into um, help people at this stage of pregnancy. Right. Very fascinating stuff. Thank you so much, Professor, Thank for you. speaking with us. That was Associate Professor Ashley St. John from the Duke NUS Medical School.